Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Tom and I have a number of topics to discuss. We're going to talk about the impact of pesticides on food production, whether or not mushrooms can save the honeybee, a beekeeping program bringing North and South Koreans together, an article by Vincent Dieterman, extraordinary lecturer in zoology and entomology from the University of Pretoria, about how Africa can solve the global honeybee crisis, Backyard beekeeping legalized in L.A. and bee tourism in Slovenia. The travel trend with plenty of buzz. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. And how are things going in Colorado? Well, we're getting some rain and it's turned cool. I don't think we're going to have a freeze, but uh, the weather has certainly changed. Well, in New York, we are enjoying weather in the 70s, and it is very pleasant to be outside, but that is going to change soon as the temperature drops over the weekend. Uh, But, you know, we are grateful for the warm weather. I would say that we have a couple more weeks before the weather really turns and that cold weather starts coming in and the first, first flakes of snow begin to fall. In the interim, we have a lot to talk about today. The first article I'd like to talk about was in the New York Times. This was published on October 19th, and the article is titled A Dangerous Cycle in Food Production, and it features a commercial beekeeper, Tim Tucker, who is also president of the American Beekeeping Federation. I just want to take a moment to read some of his quotes. He says, The bees are just not as healthy as they used to be, so they just don't do the job. And Mr. Tucker reports that losses this year in his own hives at Tucker Bees Honey in Kansas are approaching 40%. That is huge. Recently, there were reports that the bees are doing fine, that this is a record year for honey, and all sorts of other nonsense that has been out there trying to convince us that the bee decline is over. Are you seeing the same thing, Tom? No, I'm seeing just the opposite, both in my own operation and in my conversation with commercial beekeepers around the country. Uh, This is corporate propagandizing, trying to put a positive spin on what really is an environmental disaster. It certainly is. He says, I'm sitting right now looking at a soybean field. It's probably 60 to 90 or 100 acres, and there's not a single weed in this whole field. There's nothing else growing but soybeans. This is all desert land as far as the bees go. Now, I just want to take a moment and mention an interview that I did a couple of years back with Dr. Vera Krischik from the University of Minnesota, and she talked about the fact that what we've created is a desert for bees. We may have flowers, we may have different plants, but when the soil is toxic, there's no point. It's toxic to the bees. Well, the Roundup Ready uh, technology has eliminated a lot of weeds, and the systemic pesticide technology has poisoned the the groundwater, the surface water, and uh, these chemicals have migrated off-site. And there was a study that we talked about just last week about wildflowers being poisoned by these toxic chemicals. 
the wildflowers that are left that haven't been eliminated with the Roundup technology are are poisonous, and that calls into question whether habitat improvement is really a legitimate approach to trying to turn the tide of loss. This particular article was written by Beth Gardner, and she references the White House Pollinator Protection Strategy, released in May, set a goal of creating or improving bee and butterfly habitats on 7 million acres by planting on federal lands and encouraging states, localities, and businesses to do the same. You know, once again, if the soil is toxic, so are the plants that have been planted. And it's interesting that this is the second attempt by the White House to do something, but yet it's nothing more than an appeasement to those of us that have been campaigning and calling for a ban on neonicotinoids. Well, these people aren't ignorant. They're aware. And you just have to question why they would propose such a ruse. They have to know that the land has been massively poisoned, and yet they offer this up as a way to correct the problem. I said it last week. They're either massively incompetent or they're corrupt. There's no other way to answer that question of why they would propose this. Beth Gardner continues to write, any expansion of semi-wild lands helps bees by providing feeding grounds rich with flowers and weeds. And then there's another quote from Mr. Tucker. Quote, we just don't see them along the roadside anymore because they mow them or they spray them. They're even spraying the ditches for invasive weeds. Now the bottom line is, it's the soil. When you have poor soil health, you're not going to be able to provide foraging for any pollinators, whether it's the bees, the butterflies, the birds, the bats, so on and so forth. And for whatever reason, people are not grasping that critical piece of information. Well, the beekeepers grasp it, and they've been warning for the past 15 years, even longer, about these losses. They're keen observers of the state of the environment, and they they see that through the lens of a colony of bees. And they've been reporting these problems for many years. And of course, when the systemic pesticides were introduced, we were assured that they were safe and they were such a great improvement. Well, every independent study that has been done has counteracted what we've been told by the chemical industry. These chemicals have no safe dose. They're being found in the soil. They're being found in the water. They're being found in the surface water, in puddles. There are studies that have shown that puddles contain these systemic pesticides in toxic levels. The corn planting, the dust from corn planting is toxic and spreads widely. And even after that corn planting is over, there are studies that just recently have shown that the land is contaminated widely by wind-blown dust. In other words, if you have cornfields or soybean fields in your area, even though your bees may not be very close to those, the, the land your bees do forage on may be contaminated because of wind-blown dust. This is a massive contamination of the environment, and and the regulators and the, and the researchers that are getting their money from the chemical companies are doing everything they can to divert our attention away from the causes of these losses. We're losing monarch butterflies. There was an article that came out just recently that the butterfly population in the United Kingdom has declined by more than 50% in the last 40 years. And the report uh, done by a government agency over there lists all sorts of causes, and there's not one single mention of the neonicotinoids, the systemic pesticides. They're all colluding not to discuss this. Neonicotinoids has become the new N-word. Well, it's been the new N-word for quite some time. And I think if we heard one presidential candidate discuss neonicotinoids on mainstream media, I don't know, I don't know if... Uh, Never mind. Neonicotinoids have been a topic that most politicians, with the exception of a few, 
there are two senators, one in New Jersey, Senator Raymond Lesniak and Senator Brad Hoyleman, who have addressed the subject in both states respectively. So at least we have some politicians that are addressing it, but not at the level where it's needed. We really need the congressmen and congresswomen, for that matter, to step up to the plate A few years back, we had a whole list of congressmen and congresswomen who wrote to the administrator of the EPA demanding answers, and nothing came of it. That seems to be the norm. So, Tom, unfortunately, I don't know if we ever will hear anything. Well, we have to. They have to step up to the plate, because if they don't, very soon the plate is going to be empty, empty, or nearly so. The bees pollinate the most nutritious portions of the food supply. Corn and rice and wheat, things like that, are wind pollinated. They're not dependent upon the bees, but the bees are responsible for the fruit, the berries, all the things that are colorful, nutritious, and tasty. And if we lose that portion of our diet, we have a diet that will not sustain a healthy population. Well, I think what might happen is we, being the United States, might wind up importing honey because we can't produce it here. Well, we won't be able to produce it anywhere, June. I mean, we'll be able to import some of it for a time. We won't be able to import honey indefinitely because the same problems that we're facing are going to be faced from all the other food supplying countries. And it will not only be honey that we can't import, but some of the basics of our our food system. This is a massive environmental disaster, and few, if any, of the decision makers are facing up to this. They're all trying to ignore it or cover it up or say nothing. It's It's a tragic situation, and it goes far beyond the bees and the beekeepers. Tom, that brings me to the next topic, which is in regards to an article that was published by Vincent Dieterman from the University of Pretoria titled, Africa Can Solve the Global Honeybee Crisis. He's acknowledging the honeybee decline, and he's suggesting that the African honeybees be utilized. What are your thoughts on that? (laughs) I laugh because I've had a little experience with Africanized honeybees. We're on their natural territory. We're too far north. But we have had incursions occasionally, and I was using a strain of bees that came from Texas that had had gotten intermingled with the Africanized bees, and <laughs> they can be very, very aggressive, and... If you live out in the middle of eastern Montana or North Dakota, that might work. But if you're anywhere with people close by, there's an unlimited opportunity for conflict. And these bees can be very, very intimidating and do a lot of stinging in a short period of time. So I I don't see any place for the Africanized bees in American beekeeping, at least. Well, it's interesting when you take a look at the other factors involved. Aren't Africanized bees susceptible to the effects of neonicotinoids? Well, of course, they're just as susceptible as any other insect. Um, One of the strategies that the Africanized bees use for survival is to swarm frequently. Swarming meaning to divide and multiply. And they evolved that behavior in an environment where they were, there were recurring droughts. And they survived based upon the number of colonies that they were able to distribute across the landscape. The result of that, though, is they never build up to very large populations, and that impacts their honey production and their ability to pollinate the crops. And they're almost impossible to manage. They can be managed, but... It's very challenging, and I think most beekeepers, American beekeepers at least, would be reluctant to embrace the Africanized bee. It also brings up the subject of the genetically modified crops 
in Africa, and the most current statistics that I could find were published in the Encyclopedia of Earth.org, and that's eoearth.org. The last update was April 17, 2011. At that particular time, this is, once again, several years back, you're talking about 8.25 million farmers involved in genetically modified crop production in 17 countries, and that's back in 2004. That is 11 years ago. So what do you think it's at this point? So once again, when you take a look at the GM technology and combine that with the neonicotinoid pesticides or the companion technology, there is really no solution. Everybody wants to look for the holy grail when it comes to solving the problem with the global bee decline. But the bottom line is it's the the systemic pesticides. That is the common thread with all of these different issues. And there are world-renowned scientists who have addressed this repeatedly. But yet we still have people that are trying to say, no, it's this, no, it's that, when we have so much information that's out there. Well, this this uh, is not a, an issue of science because the science is overwhelming, showing what the problems are and what the damages are. This really is an issue of power and money. And nothing is going to change as long as we pursue this industrialized form of agriculture that's chemical intensive and based upon monocultures which sterilize the environment of everything but the commodity crop. This is a very destructive form of agriculture, and the only way it can survive is if it has heavy chemical inputs. And there are many competent, intelligent people who have questioned whether we should be pursuing this kind of agriculture. Ultimately, it will fail. It is unsustainable, and we need to find a more reasonable, uh, eco-friendly form of agriculture. And the bees, again, are just an indicator species warning us of the dangers. The next topic that I'd like to briefly talk about is a really amazing program that's taking place in Asia in which this particular beekeeping program is bringing North and South Koreans together. So that's kind of interesting because you're talking about two groups of people that have been rivals for so many years and are actually coming together caring for bees. Well, this is a program that was developed to try to integrate North Korean refugees into the South Korean society. Uh, the, there's something like 25,000 refugees from North Korea. Yes, and, yes. And they're very self-conscious. They're reluctant to, to share their past or talk about where they've come from. And so it's a challenge to integrate them into the South Korean society. And this beekeeping program is one small effort to do that. It's a beekeeping program that involves both North Korean refugees and South Koreans. So it's it's a step forward, a very small one, but it's interesting that bees would be that that avenue. And what's also nice is that they're able to make money from this so that they can provide for themselves through the sales of honey and beeswax candles, where they're selling them at the local farmer's market as well as online. So it's a nice little model that they're developing, and they're incorporating opportunities for students to participate. So it's something that future generations can get involved with and continue the relationship building Mm -hmm. that's taking place. I think that's really nice. Yes. There's some exciting news in Los Angeles. Backyard beekeeping has been approved. Apparently, there was a 136-year-old ban, and just this past week, the ban was overturned, and now it's legal to keep bees in Los Angeles. I just sincerely hope that the people who do decide to take a beekeeping 
think about the responsibility that's involved and not take it up because they feel that it's something trendy, what have you. But understand that they're caring for living beings that need a great deal of care. Now, Tom, you've been teaching classes for many years. For any folks that are in Los Angeles, do you have any advice? Boy, we uh, just started the fall beekeeping class uh, three weeks ago. It's an eight-week class, and we try to address all of the basics to give beekeepers, new beekeepers, a good foundation to start on. And and we have some of the same concerns that you do, Joan, that some of these people don't really understand what they're becoming involved in. And we try to make it clear that you don't just get a colony of bees and put it in your backyard like a lawn ornament. It's a participative endeavor. And, and the bees require your care, your intervention. You have to be aware of what's going on in a colony all the time. I suggest to the beekeepers, for example, that they should check in on their bees. They should open the colony. They should take a look every seven to ten days. And I use the, I use the comparison of putting three or four children in a room somewhere with a few toys. They'll do fine for a, a time, but a, a conscious parent would check on them occasionally just to see how things are going. And the bees are the same way. I tell these new beekeepers that you don't keep bees, you marry them. Um, I think that anyone who's going to undertake suburban beekeeping needs to take a, a beekeeping class of some kind and familiarize themselves with what their responsibilities are going to be before they undertake it. Either that or come visit Tom Theobald in Boulder, Colorado, and who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Just kidding, Tom. And the last article that we're going to talk about today involves bee tourism in Slovenia. The travel trend with plenty of buzz. And this was published in roughguide.com by Lucy McGuire. This is not something that's unfamiliar to either of us, but is something that is new to a lot of people. And I know that in Sevierville, Tennessee, there is a huge effort to raise awareness about the pollinator decline through public education about honeybees and other pollinators. And I know that the folks at Mojo Honey are taking the bull by the horn, so to speak, and they're really trying to do their part as far as get people to understand how vital pollinators are, especially honeybees. I know that other folks around America have been doing this for quite some time. We have our friend up in Maine who's a top bar hive beekeeper, Christy Hemingway. Christy Hemingway, yes. Christy Hemingway has been doing this for years. I know you have your friend Christine Jaffe, or Catherine, Catherine Jaffe. Catherine, yes. Catherine Jaffe, who did it in Turkey. There are a number of people that have been doing this, as I said. Marina Marchese up in Connecticut with Red Bee Apiary, she and Kim Flottam wrote a book about honey tasting and founded a society for honey tasting. They've been doing a lot to get people to understand that the honey is really something that should be cherished and treated as you would with a fine wine, with chocolate, or with any high-quality food. So I think that this is a great way to get people interested in supporting beekeepers as well as protecting the bees without taking on all the responsibility of becoming a beekeeper. I really get annoyed when I see these bloggers and these other so-called experts on the environment suggest to people, oh, if you want to help the bees, become a beekeeper. No, that's absolutely wrong. If you want to do anything, support your local beekeeping community. Or I think make that's a good point, yes. Or make a donation to the Pollinator Stewardship Council. Those folks work very hard. They're a group of commercial beekeepers that are trying to do what they can, and they do need the public support. So you can find their organization. You can find Pollinator Stewardship Council by going to pollinatorstewardshipcouncil.org. 
and make sure that you say hi to Michelle who are our friends there. Michelle Colopy. Make sure you say hi to Michelle Colopy and tell her that we sent you. <laughs> Slovenia. Slovenia is an interesting story. We don't hear much about Slovenia, and probably a lot of the listeners would have a hard time telling you exactly where Slovenia is. But Slovenia was one of the first countries to outlaw the neonicotinoids, along with France, Germany, and Italy. Slovenia is also the home of the Carniolan bee, which is one of the two primary brood stocks that we utilize here in the United States. And the Carniolan bee is probably the best choice for the small-scale beekeepers who are going to be doing bees in conjunction with other people close by. They're a more gentle bee. They're very economical with their stores. They overwinter well. For many years, I uh, used a strain called Caucasian bees, and the Caucasian bees are closely related to the Carniolan bees, and they come from the Russian state of Georgia. But Slovenia has a a, a well-developed bee culture, apparently, and they're very conscious of the role that their bees play in their society. Their tours involve tastings and farmer's markets and and this equivalent bed and breakfasts with apiary tours, and it's very interesting. So Slovenia is a leader and I think probably deserves a little more attention than we've been giving it. Certainly. And there are many other parts of the world that are very wise to what's going on with the impact of the systemic pesticides. Here in the United States, it really is a disgrace to us as Americans that our leadership is not taking more aggressive action and something has got to give. And unfortunately, I hope that that is not the future of our food. Well, stay tuned and we'll find out. On that note, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, June. It's always a pleasure to talk. Please tune in each week as Tom and I continue to discuss the impact of neonicotinoids on this weekly segment called the Neonicotinoid View. And please check the website for previous editions if you've missed any of the shows. We've been doing this for a number of years now. Hopefully, we'll see some changes. We have to stay hopeful. Yes. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, folks.